want to continue today as we look at God's word from the book of Acts. We've been uh, going through the book of Acts over the last few months and we want to uh, talk about a church that glorifies God as it comes up on the screen right now. A church that glorifies God. And uh, as the scriptures are brought up in a, few, in, a, uh, in a moment, would you all stand together? I think it's good to read the scriptures standing. It gives honor to the word of God. As uh, the scriptures are read, would you join and read this passage, a very powerful passage from the book of Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and Why don't we join in? performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Father, bless your word this morning we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, I am told that uh, a lot of men are very good when it comes to getting into the kitchen and cooking food. A lot of men are supposed to do good in that part of, uh, you know, being chefs. As for me, the kitchen and I never go together. I'm a disaster in the kitchen. In fact, sometimes when my wife is in the kitchen and I walk in, I can't help but feel that she's, uh, she's uh, focusing on Thessalonians 5.17 that says pray without ceasing. Because I'm a disaster. I remember a time when... My mother, I was with my mother and my mother had gone abroad for a few months and my aunt uh, used to come every day while I was at work and uh, leave a packet of rice in the fridge that I could use in the, uh, in, the, in the evening when I come back home after work. So I remember the first day I came back home after work and the packet of rice was there and I opened the packet, I put it onto a plate, a ceramic plate and then I put the plate on the fire and I put the, put the cooker on and I went to change and come back. I was singing a song, I think, as I normally do. And on the way back, as I was coming to the kitchen, it's a short distance from the room to the kitchen, I heard crackling sounds. And guess what had happened? The plate was disintegrating under the fire. The next day, I, I learned that day that you don't put plates onto open fire. So the next day, somebody told me, if you have an oven, put it into the oven. So my mom, mom had an oven. And I opened the packet and with the, you know, the silly, silly bags that we have, with the silly, silly bag, I put it into the oven and I went to change again. When I came back uh, to, to take my food out, there was smoke coming out of the kitchen. And guess what happened? The silly, silly bag had caught fire for the heat and the, it was called, oh, there was smoke all over the kitchen. So as you know, I am not, as I've said, I'm not one of those people who is good inside the kitchen. Now with me today, I have a recipe for Singapore chili crab. Okay, from a local newspaper. And as I look at this recipe, I find that besides having crab, you can't just bring some crabs, put it into a pot and start cooking it and expect it to be amazing. You have to add vegetable oil, salt, tomatoes, uh, water, chicken stock, uh, maybe jaggery, white vinegar, uh, soy sauce, and so many other things to make it work into all these ingredients have to go in to make it into what we know to be Singapore chili crab. Why do I feel that some of you are going to be eating Singapore chili crab today? In the same way, in Acts chapter 2, as much as you need to put the ingredients together to make a good curry, or to make a good cake. For a church to be a church that glorifies God. There are certain ingredients that need to go into that church. And Acts chapter 2. 
verses 42 to 47 gives us some idea about the ingredients that are required to become a church that truly glorifies God. And I pray that as I share in the time that I have, seven points, it's on your note, seven points that make up a church that has the right ingredients that glorifies God, you will be able to become a part of what it's all about. A church that glorifies God is not built on some structure or pure organization, but it's built by everyone in the body playing their role, being anointed and filled by the Holy Spirit and doing what the Word of God tells us to go. So let's look at these seven points. Number one, you can fill in your blank. It is a church that is built on God's Word. Let's look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. It says that the believers of that church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They were very much a part of the teaching that was happening. They were learning and they were being taught. And it tells us that a church that glorifies God has to be a church where everybody is soaking in and receiving and learning and teaching the power of the word of God. You know, one day, heaven and earth is going to pass away. Jesus himself said that. Heaven and earth will pass away. But there is one thing, one thing that will still be available, that will still hold true, that will not pass away. What is that? According to what Jesus said, what is that? It is the word of God. And therefore, my friends, why are we giving all time, a lot of our time, to everything else around us? To Facebook, to social media, to the political scene. All those things are not bad. But we should be giving as much time as we can to learning the word of God. And in this church, in the people's church, we have classes and teaching programs for everybody. We have teaching programs for the children. We have teaching programs for the youth and the young adults. We have teaching programs for the adults. We have the life classes that happen on Sunday morning. Heaven and earth may pass away, but the word of God will never ever pass away. That word is powerful. And a church that is on fire for God, that glorifies God, is a word that is truly engrossed in the word of God like the first century church. Let's look at 1 Timothy 4.13. Devote yourself to the public reading of scripture and to prayer. This is Paul's advice to Timothy. Devote yourself to the public reading of scripture. You know, as I was preparing last morning, I was going through the, the book called Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. And in that book, I found presidents, kings, rulers, philosophers, scientists, physicians, leaders, all specifying the power of the word of God the strength of the word of God even people like uh, scientists like Faraday and Newton some of the presidents of, of countries, prime ministers of countries were specifying the power of God's word and it's interesting to note that there are many symbols in the Bible to show the word of God, let's look at some of those symbols this morning to show the word of God as it comes up on the screen. It's called what? A mirror. mirror. It's called a seed that germinates and brings forth fruit. It's called a lamp that gives light. It's called a sword that can cut through. It's also called a hammer that can break the hardest places and the hardest hearts. It's called a fire that can burn. It's called milk. For new people who don't know to read the Bible, it becomes milk that gives nourishment. It's called meat for those who grow in the Lord. It's also called the bread 
of life. I wonder how much importance have you given to the word of God in your own life? You know, just last Friday, I was in my office and Pastor Errol Abhiratna, who is one of our pastors, just walked into my office and we were having a chat. And he, Pastor Errol came from a non-Christian family and he met the Lord in a marvelous way. And you know, he was telling me, Pali, he said, the thing that sustained me amidst all the challenges I faced, amidst all the opposition that I came across, was the fact that I was willing and I was wanting to learn, study, and know the Word of God. And he told me 30 years later, I still have that hunger for the Word of God. I still want to sit in one of the classes and learn. It doesn't matter who the teacher is, I still want to sit and learn about the Word of God. What about us? What about you? What about me? This church was built on God's Word. They devoted themselves to the teaching. Point two, it was a friendly church. A church that was happening. It was an attractive church. It was a place where people wanted to be. And literally thousands were coming together to spend their time in this church. They wanted to be together. They wanted to join often. They loved the community. They loved the company that they were having. And they wanted to belong to this church of Acts chapter 2. A Methodist preacher by the name of Donald English penned these words one day and I was really struck when I read these words yesterday and I think it's very true of what the church is all about. Let's look at what it says. Okay, before that, let's look at the scripture. It says, they devoted them to the fellowship of the church. And let's have the other scripture also, brother. The, the church, church is, is meant, meant to be a working, working model of, of what God, God wants, wants to do with, with the rest, rest of, society. of society. Shall we read that again? The church, the church is, is meant to be a working model of what God wants to do with the rest of society. That's God's plan. And a church must be a place where there is friendship, where people feel welcome, where people have kindness, where people are friends. And I pray to God that people's church will become that. We need to be moving towards that more and more. Acts 2.46 says this. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They were always meeting together. They have always wanted to be together in the next part of the verse. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. They were glad, they had sincere hearts and they were always together. You know, a couple of weeks ago at the miracle service that we have at the GFS Hall, a family shared their testimony of how God brought deliverance to that family and delivered the husband from the power of alcohol. And uh, according to this story, I'll read just parts of it. This lady mentioned that uh, by the end of 2017, she says, I was seriously thinking of taking the children and leaving my husband at the end of 2017. And then she told me, she mentioned how one of her neighbors invited her for the 40 days of purpose. That was going on for six weeks. And she said that she was struggling with all these problems with a husband who was addicted to alcohol. But she says that as, they, as she went for these meetings, she, I liked the company of the people who were there. I was amazed. I thought they were crazy to have such faith in a God. And she says, I began to feel a change in my life. The end story of that. Because she felt the friendliness that comes from that small group meeting in a home. Is that she decided to stay with her husband. The husband was set free. And today they worship as one family in our services. Not only that, members of their extended family also come for the services now. Why? Because they saw that the Christians in that place were a company that they like to be around. They felt the presence of God in that place. You know, the church is not just a Bible-believing church. 
not only it's also a friendly church and i wonder today if we can spread a little of that friendliness today maybe after this service is over you can just when you walk down to your car you can just tap that security guard on the shoulder and say thank you for helping us with the parking maybe you can walk up to the media room and tell some of those guys we thank you for all that you do every sunday although we never see you maybe you can go to the to the person who does your child sunday school class and tell them you know we've never spoken to you before maybe but we appreciate what you're doing for our son or our daughter the church that glorifies god is a friendly church number 3 the church that glorifies god is also a church that is energized by prayer and worship by prayer and worship let's look at acts chapter 2 verse 42 one more time they devoted themselves to prayer it says that the believers devoted themselves to prayer in acts chapter 4 when they were threatened not to speak in the name of jesus look at what they did when they heard this they raised their voices together in prayer to god Sovereign Lord they said you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them they prayed even under threat they prayed this was a church that believed in prayer and worship you know alfred lord tennyson once made a very profound statement it's not in the bible by the way but it's a very powerful meaning he said more things are what are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of and i think every one of us have seen the power of prayer in our lives can i just if you have seen a prayer answered in your life could you just wave your hand to me just to say wow look at this amazing amazing and yet we often see that when we have corporate prayer meetings that the numbers tend to drop i would encourage you as much as you pray on your own as much as you pray at services whenever there are prayer meetings organized in the church come and join us because this is what energizes the work of god prayer and worship you know in the former days when uh, we were uh, young i remember if we needed energy we took some glucose and we were given glucose by our parents or by our teachers today you have energy drinks that that athletes take when they need more energy but sometimes we can be energized by a word of encouragement a sportsman is energized by a cheering crowd but the body of christ gets energized through prayer and worship acts 247 tells us this about this church praising god and enjoying the favor of all the people they were praising god they were praising god they were praising god number 1 they were a bible studying church and that's very important because today there are a lot of teachings going around number 2 they were a friendly church number 3 this church was energized by prayer and worship i just wonder i would like the worship team to come up for a minute please i haven't finished but i would wonder is there somebody here you know that you need to strengthen yourself in the word of god this morning if so don't wait for tomorrow start today is there somebody you feel that god wants to release a sense of being a friendly person through you in the body of christ to some to a hurting person maybe to an orphan maybe to a widow number 3 Is there somebody here you feel that you need to focus a little bit more on prayer and worship in your life can we all stand together for a moment i think it's a good thing you know we have we have a wonderful worship team i'll tell you uh, i don't travel much but i've been in a number of churches abroad not a lot of them but i've been in many of them a uh, uh, quite well not many but quite a few uh, and there have been good services i've attended in some of these churches and i love It's nice to be in other churches 
But I'll tell you, I'm so blessed by this worship finish that we get from our worship finish. And this is not to bring down any other church, by the way. I'm sure people in their church feel the same way about their church as well. But I love being a part of the worship ministry of this church. Therefore, this morning, we want to worship our God as the first century church. And what, a be what better way to worship Him than by singing about the holiness of our God. Would you all join together as we worship God this morning? Voice rising in worship. Let's raise our hearts to our Lord and worship Him. worship. We've just worshipped God. Now I go on to point number four of a church that glorifies God. It is a church that is powered by the Holy Spirit. A church that is powered by the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes on, you hear people, it being said, 
this is powered by Microsoft or powered by WordPress or powered by some other organization or some company or some uh, maybe infusion soft or whatever so many things that tend to power things but the church is powered in only one way and that is the power of the Holy Spirit of God would somebody say amen, amen. this morning we sang we stand in awe of you and we should be in awe of what the Spirit of God can do in our midst sadly it seems like the church is losing its power the church some churches are losing the power but we need to ask God for a fresh infusion of power let's look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 43 everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the Apostles there was awe. there were many wonders and there were many signs Acts 433 says this with great power the Apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all I want to know how many of you ask God to empower you every morning when you start your day the Spirit of God to empower you you know we live in a world where there is so much of evil so much of evil coming against families coming against our children coming against the body of Christ it's only the power of the Holy Spirit that can take the church to where God wants it to be and I thank God that in this church we've been talking a lot in the recent past about the works in fact that's exactly why we are doing this series on the book of Acts somebody said it should be called the book the book of not the book of Acts but the of the Apostles but the book of Acts of the Holy Spirit because this book is filled with the works of the Holy Spirit and God is still working powerful signs and wonders in our midst through the power of his Holy Spirit just recently we had a powerful testimony uh, once again at our miracle night service a gentleman who doesn't come to our church he got up and testified about how his wife uh, daughter rather was diagnosed with a severe cancer and how God touched that lady this is a father talking about his own daughter about the power of God that touched but one thing I loved about that testimony and I have it here on the, in this file that I have with me is that he was saying how at regular intervals coming back to point two in my sermon he mentioned uh, many names of people in the team there who have been constantly calling him and encouraging him and talking to him encouraging him to believe in the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit operated wherever God's people meet there is great power it's the power that that can set people free and when you come in for service on Sunday morning or Sunday evening will you come believing that the same power of God can set you free this morning we prayed for many of you believe God that the power of the Holy Spirit will answer the cry of your heart and set you free from whatever is 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 coming against you right now when the early church received the power of the Holy Spirit it was never the same again never the same again but it's made up of every one of us not just a pastor every one of us receiving the power of God's Holy Spirit number five I've got to rush because time's running out generosity was evident everywhere Acts 2 44 and 45 all the believers were together and had everything in common they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need you know all of a sudden the church that was a few hundreds became a few thousands overnight and there were lots of people needing attention there were lots of people from outer areas and they had to be taken care of so the church got together they sold what they could they gave what they could and there was generosity oozing out of that church as I was preparing I remember there's a pop song that went on the radio it says I feel it in my fingers I feel it in my toes the love is all around me and so the feeling grows uh, anyway something about 
uh, and I thought what a, uh, the words were very meaningful to this whole idea of generosity and even today this church is one of the most generous churches I think the most generous church I have been in I, I love the generosity of our church because you always give and give a lot and even today you've given for a family that needs to be known to be told that they are loved but may our generosity keep growing may it keep growing May it be in our fingers and our toes. May it be all around us. So that this church will be known as a church that is always generous. This church took care of its own. And we as a church. Uh, Pastor Dishan mentioned about the, the boxers for care and concern. Please drop in whatever you can to bless people who are in need. Because, and it can be done every week. Because we need to be a generous people. Point six. Evangelism happened every day or daily. It brought glory to God because every day people were being added to the church. Let's read Acts 2.47. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And also in Acts chapter 5 verse 14 this is what it says. Nevertheless more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. So they were in Jerusalem and lots of people were coming into the church because they were going out and sharing Jesus. But then persecution struck. Stephen was killed. And they had to scatter all over because persecution started in the church. And they were scattered all over. But guess what happened when they were scattered? Acts 8 and 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Guess what happened? Even when they were scattered, wherever they went, they preach the word. When was the last time you shared Jesus with somebody? When was the last time you told somebody that God loves them? When was the last time you invited them for an outreach service? I'm not trying to put guilt, please. I'm only trying to provoke your thinking. When was the last time you told somebody of what God has done in your life? It's very nice. You know, sometimes people come and they, they, they talk, they give you a, a tract or something. And I like it when, I, when that happens because it means somebody is trying to win someone for the Lord. And I remember one instance, I had preached in a church in a foreign country and it was a thriving church. I preached two services and uh, that was the Sunday and God really moved in those services. God was very present in the services. And on Tuesday, I think two or three days later, they, began, they were having an outreach meeting, uh, outside meeting. It was in a park. And it was an evening service, evening meeting. So I went there. You know, sometimes we preachers can get carried away when, when God uses us. And I, was, I walked there um, uh, in the ground and I was hoping that uh, people would see me and, and uh, they would say, they would be happy that the preacher of Sunday came to be with them at this meeting. Not one person recognized me. And then I went and stood near one of the stalls. Guess what happened? Somebody came and stood by my side. He said, hi. I said, hi. And I thought he'll say, wow, we loved your priest sermon on Sunday. We really loved your preaching. That's what I thought. He gave me a, a tract. And he said, have you met Jesus? <laughs> but you know, I was very happy. Because that guy was trying to share Jesus with somebody. And that's what makes my heart glad. It didn't matter it was me, the preacher. I may have got saved again that day, but anyway. He, he was doing a great job for the Lord. When did you last share Jesus with somebody? When did you last tell somebody that God loved them? Evangelism happened daily. Before I go to my final point, I've got five minutes more. Let's look at the points one more time. Number one, this church that glorified God was a built on God's word. Number two, it was a friendly church. You can speak it a little louder. Number three, energized by prayer and worship. Number four, powered by the... Number five, generosity was everywhere. I feel it in my fingers and my toes. Number six, evangelism happened daily. And number seven... There was extreme devotion. The word extreme is not a nice word today. We use this word extremist. And the word extremist has many meanings according to the dictionary. 
they are all bad meanings. Illegal, violent, fanatic, radical, fundamentalist, militant. But I think it's a good thing for God's people to be extreme in their devotion to their Lord. It means that you will not be ashamed to have a soft drink while everybody else is drinking alcohol around the table. It means that you will refuse to cut a deal when all your colleagues are doing it. It means that you will speak the truth when everybody else is lying. It means that you will carry the Bible in your hand even though people may laugh at you. Acts 2.42 says this. They devoted themselves. They devoted themselves. It was not the normal devotion found in the temple or even in the synagogue. This was extreme. Jesus, the church, God, ministry, evangelism was all that mattered to these people. They were sold on it. They loved it. They were doing it. They were extreme. You know, it is said, and I close with this, that the bishop of Smyrna, Polycarp, was captured to be killed. And it's, it's, like a, it's like a movie when you read that story. I was reading it yesterday, like a movie. Old man, 86 years old, and they brought him into the, into the place where they were killing Christians. And the, the Roman official, it's called a proconsul, he, he wanted him to reject Christ. Polycarp said, 86 years, I have served him. He has never failed me. Let me down. How can I reject? I mean, I'm not saying the exact words, okay? How can I reject this God? They said, we have wild animals. He said, then bring them on. We are not, you know, we won't give up what is evil. What is good for what is evil. Then he said, we can set you on fire. He said, that's the fire that can be quenched. Be more careful about the fire that cannot be quenched. And then they tied him to a stake. And they lit the fire. According to the story, the fire didn't even touch his body. And they had to actually stab him with a dagger to kill him. Now that is extreme devotion. And I pray that every one of us in this congregation will have that kind of devotion to God because when the church comes together with that devotion, it is a church that glorifies God. When you will not cut corners, when you will not take the way that other people take, when you will stand firm in your truth for the truth of God's word, when you will not be ashamed, to say you are a child of God. Yes, you'll be laughed at, you'll be scoffed, you'll be mocked, you'll be insulted. But that's what extreme devotion to Christ is all about. So let's look at numbers, the seven numbers, and I close with this. God's word, friendliness, prayer and worship, the Holy Spirit, generosity, evangelism, extreme devotion. If you put a score of 1 to 7, how would you score this morning? How would you score this morning? Is it the word that needs encouragement in your life? Is it worship and prayer? Is it generosity? Is it friendliness? Is it a renewing of the Holy Spirit in your life? Is it evangelism? All this put together make up extreme devotion. And no wonder, no wonder, literally thousands were coming to that church. And it kept coming. They kept coming in the hundreds and the thousands because this was a church that attracted people because they glorified God. Shall we stand together? Maybe one of these thoughts struck you. Maybe two. Maybe more. But if so, I don't want you to go without taking a decision to apply it into your life today. And the best time to start is today. The Bible says today is the day. Now is the time.